32 or something. That's the start. That would be it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this CHF Talks webinar on automated decision making and health. Uh, my name's Jo Root. I'm the policy director here at CHF and I'll be facilitating this afternoon's session. Um, before we go into the session, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands that we are meeting on today. I'm on the lands of the uh, Ngunnawal and Nambri people here in Canberra. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their custodianship of this land. Um, it's always important in health to remember that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have worse health outcomes than the general population, and all of our work should be aimed at reducing that gap in health outcomes. So thank you, everybody. And feel free to put in the chat it, which lands you're on if you're an attendee. Um, that would be good. So today we're going to hear from... Um, four people. I'll introduce you to the two presenters first, who are going to give us an overview of the work that they're doing on automated decision making. The first um, two speakers, the first is Ash Watson, Dr. Ash Watson, who's a research fellow. She's a sociologist who researches the current and anticipated impacts of emerging technologies in the context of health and well-being. She's looking currently at developments in health tech startups and how health consumers can make sense of health information about themselves, their communities and their environment. And she's also done work on COVID-19, including a co-authored book, The Face Mask in COVID Times, which sounds like a great read, Ash. I look forward to that. Um, Vaughan Wozniacki O'Connor is a research fellow as well. He's a media artist and emerging technology researcher. His research explores art-based and creative applications of emerging technologies. And he's undertaken creative projects both internationally and nationally, including for the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney, the Plimsoll Gallery in Tasmania, the Condensary in Queensland, and in Portugal and New York. So thank you to both of those. And I'm going to hand over to you to um, take us through the first session. So thanks, Ash and Vaughan. Thanks so much for that introduction, Joe. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Can you see my full slideshow or can you see it with the, is it full screen for you? It's got all the, um, your what your basically your web page your computer desktop on it oh not, okay not in presenter mode oh we did a test and everything uh, maybe just try that from current slide button and see if that kind of tweaks it oh no that's weird no. sorry everybody technical difficulties immediately let me just close out of my PowerPoint and start again. Um, but I will say while I'm doing that, thanks so much for joining us for this session. Um, Vaughan and I are researchers, as Joe said, with uh, the ARC Centre of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. Uh, this is a nationally funded research centre funded by the Australian Research Council. And we're very glad to have Consumers Health Forum of Australia uh, as one of our official partners uh, on, this, on this project. Vaughan and I work at the UNSW node of the centre, uh, working in the health focus area, uh, hence, our, hence our talk today. Um, our research looks at the, um, what's happening, I suppose, in, in emerging health technologies in Australia. Um, and we... If I share now, I'll be able to show you. <laughs> no, it's still not working. Oh, I'm so sorry. I don't know what happened between um, the tests that we did. 
I cannot get it to work. Uh, someone in chat is saying needs to go to presentation mode or go to slideshow tab. Yeah, that's what I'm trying, but I can't seem to access it. I press the buttons and then nothing happens. If it will move through, just take it through as it is, I think. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, everybody. I know it's not kind of as nice a look as the full um, as the full mode, but I can't seem to figure out what's wrong. So we'll press ahead. Um, yeah, so, so we're here to talk about um, some of the developments that we have been researching in, in automation and AI. Uh, as we begin, I'd like to echo Joe's sentiments and especially like to acknowledge the medical people who are the traditional custodians of the unceded lands uh, where we work in Sydney, where the UNSW Kensington campus is situated, um, where Vaughan and I are presenting from today. And we would like to pay our respects to the elders, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today or who are tuning into this recording uh, sometime in the future. Uh, the uh, Centre of Excellence is a very large centre, but uh, here are the core members of our research team um, who have done the work that I'll be speaking about with Vaughan today. So there's myself. As Joe said, um, I'm a sociologist, so a social science background. Um, Vaughan and I have been working closely together uh, with Sharp Professor Deborah Lupton, who is a digital and health sociologist and um, also does work in uh, media and communication studies. The health focus area of the Centre of Excellence um, has, has a broad approach into researching how these technologies are coming to be part of the landscape of health and well-being in Australia. Um, we have a real commitment in doing this research in, as I've bolded in the bottom there, to ensuring that ethical and inclusive implementation is happening that will benefit all social groups. So that's really kind of a driving motivation of the research that we're doing, uh, what, directs, what directs our interests in this space in looking at how this technology uh, can make a real difference to people's lives, um, who it is making a difference for, and uh, as well as kind of what are the ethical considerations, um, who gets to be involved in design processes, who the kind of key people are um, that these designs are being made for, um, as well as who is um, left behind in, in some of these new processes. So um, our interests, as some of the key questions they indicate, uh, looking at what kinds of technologies are being designed in Australia. A lot of time we hear about things in the news are actually uh, developments that are happening in other places like America and in Europe. So we bring, um, well, we're taking into consideration a global context. We're particularly interested in examining what's happening here in Australia. So what is being applied um, how different health publics in Australia are being affected and involved, as well as what designs are actually locally are made. So in exploring these things, we're interested in who gets to design these technologies. So whose expertise is considered, whose voices are considered, um, what kinds of health issues are these designs intending to alleviate and address? Um, who are these technologies being designed for? Uh, as Vaughan and I will speak about, we're also super interested in what technologies are actually being used. I think a lot of times when we hear about um, automation and AI, um, a lot of reporting is speculative. It's um, kind of very early piloted projects or things that are being imagined and worked towards rather than realised in the present. So we're really interested in getting a good sense of what technologies are actually gaining ground and seeing a meaningful application and implementation. Um, and in, in examining that, we are interested in what are the current, what are the emerging, and what are the imagined impacts of these technologies across the whole spectrum of, of applications that we are seeing. Okay. 
Uh, so just to give an overview, um, I'm going to provide a bit of a background into the research that Vaughan and I have been doing, covering what is automated decision making, what do I mean when I say AI, and give a bit of a summary of the core research that we've been doing over the past 12 months, which is the first 12 months of this uh, program within the Centre of Excellence. And then I'm going to hand over to Vaughan, who's going to give some uh, select examples of what is actually being used in health in Australia today. And uh, to finish, before we hand over to our other panellists, um, we'll, he'll briefly touch on uh, so what. What are the impacts? What are the implications? And what are some of the social interest uh, issues that we are interested in in this space? So what do I mean when I say what is um, automated decision making? What is AI? Um, there aren't simple definitions because these terms are a bit like umbrella terms. Uh, they mean multiple things, but they also mean both technological objects. So something like a computer program. Um, and they also refer to a process or a method of doing something. So that's um, part of the reason why there aren't nice and simple uh, definitions for these things. Uh, but I'm going to give it a go and try and explain it in, a, in hopefully a relatively simple way. We understand automated decision making as the use of data of machines and of algorithms to make decisions with varying degrees of human insight or intervention. So sometimes automated decision-making is imagined as a program that, or a computer, a machine that exists without any human interaction or without any human oversight, uh, without um, kind of anybody there really, kind of overseeing the decisions or inputting the data. Um, but what we really see in the actually existing forms of this technology is that there are many degrees of human engagement with these systems. They are still very much human-led uh, processes, human-designed machines. Uh, people input the data um, and use the programs to, to help make decisions in various contexts. So similarly, artificial intelligence, we can think about as using a computer to simulate uh, rational behaviours and perform very specific tasks. So this can be recognising speech, uh, text or images, and then finding results from a data set. So some examples of artificial intelligence that you might be familiar with are things like Siri on your smartphone or the way that Google search works. Um, also uh, uses some of these artificially intelligent processes. And as I emphasize there at the bottom, um, there are overlaps between these things. These aren't uh, separate, totally discrete systems. They're very related. And that's because they aren't one separate thing. These are umbrella terms for a constellation of different technologies. And kind of despite, uh, you know, popular representations that we might see in the movies or in pop culture, um, automated decision making and AI are not machines that have human capabilities um, and they're not systems that are free from human input. So they are things like a computer program that people interact with, um, that people design, that people put to use. Um, to do things like making decisions in different contexts. So the research that we have been doing as a part of the centre for the first uh, 12 months of the program, so the 12 months leading up until today, um, has been focused on mapping the current landscape in Australia. We've been working to develop a really strong picture of what actually exists here in Australia. So what is being designed, what is actually being implemented, where these things are, and who is involved in that implementation. Uh, so the kind of key developments that we're seeing and what these terms like automation and AI actually mean in everyday life is our real focus. So to develop this picture, um, what our team has done is We've read and analysed a really large amount of uh, news reports, 
websites, newsletters, company reports, research reports, online articles, all of these different kinds of texts that talk about emerging health technologies in Australia. We've compiled, compiled sorry, a really big list of everything that they've discussed. And then we followed up with those lead, the leads from those articles to track down where those technologies are now. So who is using them, if they're actually being used with who and how, um, or if they were just a quick news story and not all that much has actually happened since. Uh, we also looked for the patterns across these reports. So about how these technologies are talked about, um, what kinds of things get a lot of coverage and what kinds of language these reports use, how the benefits and the drawbacks of the technologies are portrayed. So from this, we've developed a picture of the key developments that are happening in Australia in this space. Uh, the image here gives a little indication of some of the big categories that we've found. So self-tracking and remote monitoring, telehealth and cloud computing platforms, assistive technologies, robotics, and machine imaging. Um, I'm now gonna pass over to Vaughan, who's going to break some of these categories down and give some examples of what they actually mean. So what these technologies look like um, and what these technologies do. Uh, so Vaughan, I'll pass over to you. You can let me know when you'd like the next slide um, and I'll scroll on down. Perfect, thanks, Ash. Um, so I guess, yeah, jumping off from um, what Ash was kind of mentioning, um, I think the kind of really interesting thing a lot of, with a lot of these technologies that in some way that they're perhaps a bit more mundane than you might expect for emerging tech. Um, and especially when we're talking about um, terms like AI, um, a lot of the applications that we've seen are not necessarily um, resembling like a human style intelligence or something along those lines, but a big raft of those kind of technologies that we uh, initially kind of came across were in the monitoring and tracking space. Uh, so a lot of, there are a few examples of wearable devices, which were kind of um, more focused on monitoring the health and well-being of the elderly and vulnerable communities and people that are kind of perhaps geographically remote and not kind of close to an urban center. Um, some of these devices are kind of similar to fitness trackers like uh, the Fitbit or Apple Watch, um, and include things like step count and heart, heart rate monitoring as well. Uh, however, a lot of these devices also focus more on tracking um, and monitoring of things like fall detection and um, kind of general well being um, rather than sort of like classic um, exercise or athletic performance metrics. Uh, so, one example that we came across was the MCARE series of devices. Um, and I guess the, the thing that a lot of our research was really focusing on as well is, is trying to find Australian examples of, of new technologies as well. That were kind of like, not just things that were being used here that were kind of from overseas, but things that were sort of like from Australia in a way as well. So the kind of MCARE um, company has a series of different uh, personal alarms, smartwatches and fall detection pendants. Um, and these devices do things like send automated messages to carers, um, send messages to emergency services or family members if they detect a fall or if the user presses like an SOS function. Um, additionally, these kind of tracking devices capture lo motion, uh, location and heart rate data of the user um, and can be shared with like paramedics and rescue services. So alongside these more kind of intensive functions, the NCARE watch um, and pendants also provide customized medication reminders um, as well as a wellness and quality life feature, which is essentially like a daily questionnaire that prompts the user to um, self assess their, their well being. Um, and that data, this kind of questionnaire data, along with the other data collected by this device, um, reports back to, to carers who can kind of remotely monitor the well being of the kind of primary device user. Um, another thing that kind of came up in our research was um, the way that these monitoring um, and tracking devices were starting to interface with smart home technologies also. So smart home technologies allow people to automate and control and monitor their domestic spaces via network sensors, 
um, and often described as the Internet of Things. So some kind of common examples are like the Amazon Echo or Google Assistant. Um, but it also kind of expands to things like intercoms and appliances, which are internet connected and incorporate increasingly uh, more sophisticated functions like voice, gesture, and, and sometimes facial recognition. Uh, so smart home systems um, in some instances can automate everyday tasks, um, like you know, turning lights on and off and, um, and you know, respond to voice commands. But the kind of interesting thing in the context of wearable devices and self-tracking devices um, is this, yeah, that, that they're increasingly these devices are kind of part of a suite where the, the, the home kind of monitors the user's well-being and the kind of user can also monitor the home as well. So an example of that is the, the Ferros Care, uh, Care at Home. So Ferros Care is based in Queensland um, and it uses a combination of motion sensors as well as wearable detection pendants and other sensors like and microphones and things to promise a, a seamless health monitoring experience uh, to ensure your loved one's safety and peace of mind. So in this system, sensors monitor the use of applications, uh, appliances rather, so things like, you know, stoves, toasters, kettles, that sort of thing, to kind of get a sense of, of people's activity levels and also as a way of trying to, to get a sense of whether someone is um, unwell or not as well. So in these systems, people can also remotely ac access this data to kind of keep an eye on, on, on um, potentially sick relatives as well, or kind of aging relatives. Um, so just on the next slide, thanks, Ash. Um, so kind of one of the, perhaps one of the more, um, what you might expect is one of the, the more, um, uh, what might come to mind, I guess, more when we think talking about um, artificial intelligence and emerging tech is machine imaging. And this is definitely a, kind of a significant application of automated decision making and AI in the, the context of health. Um, so machine imaging is, can be thought of as a method and tool for the analysis um, and recognition of objects and patterns in images. In the health and medical context, this often relates to uh, the analysis of digital imaging data from medical devices like x-rays, CT scans, um, and MRIs, uh, particularly in radiology, which generates uh, a large quantity of digital images. Um, this has kind of provided a fertile ground for people to start working on machine learning and deep learning models to um, aid in the detection of diseases and, and health conditions as well. Um, it, we're kind of also seeing that beyond just that, that more machine learning oriented um, medical to like quite high end medical context. Uh, but there are also examples of mobile applications of this as well. So um, people are starting to use smartphones to diagnose things like skin lesions from, from melanoma. Uh, but also it's, it's being the object recognition and the SLAM, which is the kind of, um, you know, accelerometer and depth sensing functions on a smartphone. Um, and yeah, these functions are being used um, kind of as a form of machine imaging to do informal health assessments um, rather than kind of advanced forms of diagnosis. So kind of an example of this is the um, early vision test developed by the Uni of Melbourne, um, their center of eye research, which uses simplistic object recognition and depth sensing to do like a very simple test for eyesight. Um, so I think the interesting thing about this and some of the other applications in this kind of space is that not necessarily like replacing um, more kind of clinical forms of diagnosis, that they're just offering almost like a, a soft way for people to engage with medical professionals or kind of gain more understanding of their own health um, that's potentially less confronting than like a doctor's visit. Um, yeah, and so kind of beyond that context as well, I think it's, it's um, and I, I, yeah, the, something that was really worth touching on also was the uh, prevalence of cloud computing um, platforms or, or technologies or, or kind of software. Um, and cloud computing refers to distributed software whose kind of assets and application data are hosted online and don't 
depend on like a, a physical piece of computer hardware or, or a site uh, for access. Uh, so cloud computing is offer on-demand access to shared databases, software, files, and they've obviously, since the kind of explosion of big data in the, the kind of 2010s, they've kind of increasingly become more pervasive. Um, and I and spurred on by COVID as well, I think that we're kind of increasingly familiar with cloud computing as well. And it's definitely changed the way that we work in a quite a significant way. Um, I think it's interesting in that context, also just the point that when we talk about things like um, cloud computing that and, and artificial intelligence, that potentially they relate to this idea of the AI effect, which is that as something becomes more commonplace, we kind of decreasingly think of it as AI and just think of it as, oh, this is cloud computing or this is, is um, you know, a particular technology. Um, so a couple, just one local example of cloud computing, um, Sun Pathology and the Sectra digital platform, pathology platform. So focusing on clinical pathology, specifically around skin cancer imaging diagnosis and care. Um, the Sectra system provides remote and collaborative access to shared diagnostic imaging and case materials. Um, in the press materials that we surveyed, um, Sectra promotes cloud-based collaboration between different lab sites in Queensland. Um, some of the benefits that they describe include things, classic features of um, cloud computing, like collaboration across sites, um, but also the, this um, multi-site collaboration, this kind of dis distributed collaboration um, was, you know, an innovation from more traditional diagnostic procedures and practices that may involve like glass slides and microscopes and that sort of stuff. Uh, so just onto the next slide, thanks Ash. So another kind of interesting field that came up um, in our research was assistive tech. Um, and as I'll, I'll kind of point to towards the end of um, some of the examples as well, there's a bit of a kind of overlap between a lot of these, these um, technologies as well. Um, but I guess more traditionally assistive tech is kind of created in response to the specific needs of a particular you know, consumer or patient. Uh, so it could include things like bespoke prosthetics or, or support devices, um, which kind of help people form tasks, which might be kind of difficult or impossible to perform otherwise. Um, in one of the examples that we kind of came across was the Starkey Labs Libio Edge AI hearing aid and the AI Poly, which is a, a smartphone based um, vision visual detection app. Uh, so for the Libio Edge, it boasts that it uses artificial intelligence to um, analyze the sonic environment of its user um, and then filter to improve how feet, improve how speech is filtered against background noise. And kind of relating back to this, this talk of tracking devices also, the Libio Edge um, is used to track health metric, metrics as well. So apparently being placed on the head rather than the wrist is a kind of a better space, like better location for like a self-tracking device and can be used to detect uh, brain health and hearing health as kind of metrics for general um, health and well-being as well. Um, interestingly, that is another device that was used for fall detection as well. Um, as I mentioned, in a similar context, the AI Poly is used for, it caters for visually impaired users and was co-founded by Queensland technologist, Brenda Chang. So the application uses smartphone camera and object recognition to provide audio descriptions of text, food, plants, and basic cover, colors and everyday objects. So additionally, the AI Poly app collects images from users and continuously adds data for object recognition learning data sets. So I think an interesting, this is kind of an interesting promise or, or aspect of a lot of these technologies as well is that they promise that through continued use and uptake that the system itself continues to kind of learn and improve over time. Uh, so next slide, thanks, Ash. So one of the other, the, the, one, of the term, one of the applications that came up quite a bit as well was uh, in robotics. Um, we searched for artificial intelligence in our searches rather than robotics, but a lot of robotics applications came up um, additionally as well, which was quite interesting. Um, 
So one example is the Da Vinci surgical system, which is like a very large kind of, um, you know, prosthetic robotic system that a surgeon will use to do microsurgery. Um, and it's being used in New South Wales and in Victoria in like a private health setting. Um, but kind of beyond that, that more high-end medical context, um, there was also this proliferation of like care robotics used in aged care, as well as hygiene robots um, that kind of came out in the wake of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, as well as like telepresence robots also. So a particularly pervasive one is the Paro robot, which some of you might be familiar with. It's essentially like a, a fur seal. So it's covered with soft white fur, has you know, very cute, big googly eyes and, and eyelashes, big eyelashes. And it's been used across Australia to treat patients with dementia in the aged care context. So it's equipped with temperature sensors, sound sensors, touch sensors, and encourages users to kind of like, you know, pet and care for this robot, like but similar to a kind of a, pet, a cat or a dog or something along those lines. So the pyro kind of, um, while it reacts to users, it also records how people interact with the robot. Uh, and that data can then be used for staff to monitor behavior changes to kind of like get a set, get a judge on people's well-being um, also, which is quite interesting. Um, and that's being used in, yeah, across the Orem aged care facilities in New South Wales and Victoria um, and Gunther and Farnora facilities in Queensland. Uh, I think Regis Care um, has been using pyro robots since 2015 and has 48 robotic seals used in facilities nationwide. Um, just another quick example of a similar kind of robot used in the aged care context is the, the one that's kind of the, the sketch of on the slide there, which is the NOW robot. So it's more, more often used for like STEM education. Um, it's being used in Brightwater and Michael Moran aged care facilities in New South Wales and WA. Um, similar to the Pyro, it's kind of cute and stylized and users can kind of touch and speak to the robot. Um, and it's being used more for, to encourage social interaction um, and kind of enrichment for um, residents. Uh, so in response to, to COVID as well, robots have been seen as a really big way to address worker shortages and kind of ameliorate infection risk. Uh, with the Canberra-based company Robots for Good doing like a limited trial of telepresence robots uh, where they're using them to monitor um, the well-being of, of one or two patients in a, a facility in um, Wollongong. Um, so this is a very kind of emerging trial that we're kind of seeing at the moment. And I think it's this, this kind of seems to be renewed interest in telepresence robots, uh, which I think will be a very interesting space to watch in the future. Um, beyond that kind of context, there's also kind of almost like a, a development of some of the more banal um, technologies that we might be familiar with, like the Roomba. Um, the Japanese company SoftBank is manufacturing a kind of a large commercial cleaner called the Wiz, which has a UVC attachment, which is used to destroy COVID-19 particles in air and on hard floor surfaces. So that's being used in kind of by a, a series of industrial cleaning companies in New South Wales. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's just kind of, um, yeah, interesting to note so some of these applications are perhaps not what we might have expected from uh, more popular, uh, pervasive understandings of artificial intelligence and kind of, um, yeah, or as it, something that might be replacing the doctor or something along those lines. Um, maybe next slide. Some great questions coming up in the chat. Um, so just in terms of some of the, the, um, the keywords and things that seem to come up continuously as we, we did our research and kind of across a, a raft of different technologies, um, keywords that came up as really important were things like safe, secure, private, accurate, automatic, real time, uh, you know, cost saving and cost, um, you know, reducing waste were seen as really big, um, important terms. Um, which I think were kind of this, these, a lot of these terms kind of crossed, they were specific to the health context, but were almost agnostic to application. They were kind of beyond just like a particular application, like um, um, tracking or, 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 or 
robotics or what have you. Uh, so maybe the next slide, Ash. So yeah, just in terms of some of the, the kind of questions that were, was kind of interesting, and it'd be interesting to see how, um, what people kind of think of some of the questions we're, we're talking about. And, and there's definitely some really interesting ones coming up in the chat as well. Um, yeah, I think that what's, there's some really interesting questions about, you know, especially things like smart technologies and smart homes, how that they, how that they um, change our understanding of things like assist, our understanding of, yeah, something like assistive technology and how the smart home is, is playing a different role in that, that kind of expanding that definition. Uh, but also, as it says there, this, how we kind of, how some of these technologies um, impact traditional healthcare um, or how they might, you know, um, address some of the, 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 the challenges of the current healthcare system as well. Um, but I think, yeah, this the kind of question of what these technologies, what's actually out there and what's, um, what's out there versus what is the impact and what's the kind of human interaction in, in all of these kind of things is, is what we're really interested in as well. Um, what, yeah, beyond just the kind of the promise of these things. But yeah, I'll stop talking because I could just bl <laughs> blather on forever and we want to grab um, some more uh, time for chats with people. But yeah, here's our contact information as well. So um, yeah, feel free to get in touch. Thanks very much, Vaughan and Ash, and there are some good questions. And before we go to the next two speakers, I think some of the questions are looking at some of the ethical issues. So when Steph and um, Roma respond, they might want to think about that. And also sort of the impact of some of this technology on the people that are um, receiving it, um, having it inflicted on them, however you want to describe it. We might go now to our two respondents, if you like. The first one is Steph Dr. Stephanie Chaucers, who works for DataWe, um, and she leads partnerships and research governance at clinical data company DataWe. Um, she's passionate about the translation of big data and AI and enabled research and real world solutions that will help maintain and enhance the world-class healthcare system. Um, she also heads up the federally funded National AI for Healthcare Training Program delivered by Intel, IntelliQ, which is really interesting. Um, the second respondent is Roma Shisera, who is um, who gave up her professional life to explore the world and give something back to the community. She volunteers with consumers and local council organisations. Um, she's worked across pharmaceutical, medical devices, patient health service software, and currently her focus is on helping people navigate the healthcare system. So we might go to Steph and then to Roma, and then we'll take questions. So over to you, Steph. Yeah, awesome. Thank you so much, Joe, for that introduction, and um, Vaughan and Ash for that interesting talk, you know, covering the broad spectrum of potential uses and, and current uses of AI in healthcare. Um, there's, there's so many, it's hard to cover them all. Um, I think it's been really interesting looking as well at the questions that people are, are coming up with when looking at these applications, because there's so many, you know, really valid questions about, you know, the risk, um, how do we address bias? How do we ensure there's security? How do patients have participation in these kinds of tools? Um, and something that we sometimes kind of forget to look at when we're talking about all these cool solutions that AI can address um, is the data. Because data is not always a very exciting word to most people. Um, but when you actually start to think about it, you know, how is AI making decisions about a patient or helping a clinician make decisions about a patient? How does it know anything about that patient or, or that disease? It's, it's through information. Um, and the information that that technology is receiving will dictate how accurate, how safe, how ethical it is. So we really need to start with the foundation of AI by looking at the data and making sure that we have really robust, secure, what we sometimes call healthy data. So it's cleansed, it's representing what's going on in the real world. You know, AI technologies don't go to med school. They don't have eyes and ears most of them. Um, so we need, we are feeding in the information and that information needs to be accurate. And that is where we can really, you know, nip in the bud any of these potential risks that can occur from AI. 
Um, so that is uh, one of the problems that we're addressing at the Tawi. Um, and the way we are doing that is we are supporting hospitals and healthcare systems in building a really robust, enriched, healthy data set from their patient data. Um, first and most important part is that that patient data is de-identified always. So we've, we've solved the problem of, of privacy risk by um, only working within hospital systems and before any data goes into our very secure environment is de-identified. So no identifiable data leaves any healthcare system. Um, but what that enables us to do is to link um, the data, de-identified data from multiple healthcare sites so that they can be used for research. And by linking these multiple data sets, we actually produce a really big data set that is really representative of lots of different people. So when you're going to have an AI tool that's going to be supporting a clinician in, in looking at individual patients, you know, a, a really simple example that is used a lot is um, sepsis prediction. So um, as amazing as our doctors are, they aren't mind readers or, or psychics, and they can't always predict as far in the future as would be helpful. And so AI can actually help us do that. And one of those tools is, is prediction of septic shock, which is a big, big killer in ICU. A lot of people die because it can come on very quickly. Um, and the earlier you can treat someone for it, the more likely you can prevent a death or, or serious outcomes. Um, you know, we've worked on calibrating a model of AI that can actually predict the onset of sepsis two days before it happens. Now that's with varying degrees of accuracy, but you can imagine how life-saving that could be if a doctor could know, okay, I need to treat this patient now, not two days later. Um, but in order for that to be an accurate tool for all the variety of different patients that that doctor would see, it needs to have been trained on data that represents all those patients. So again, that's why, you know, at Datawi, we look at building a really big comprehensive data set. Um, and I wasn't actually going to share slides, but I did find um, just two, so it won't really um, be a big talk on my slides, but if I can share my screen, I will just bring up one to help sort of visualise what I'm talking about. Um, yep, that's worked. So um, this slide here just sort of shows how if we, if we look in, if we think about um, data as really being the centre of the research translation lifecycle. So AI, I guess, is, is just another form of research that, that it, well, it's a tool that helps translate research into an actual practical tool that can be used, um, you know, in society and in healthcare. And in the centre of that, um, if you look at this figure eight, is really the data. And that fuels, you know, so medical research data um, is, is collected or clinical data that's done in a controlled environment. Um, is, is sort of collected through that scientific method. And this can be, you know, in academia, in, in clinical settings. And then the data that comes from the, the patient and the healthcare system um, can also be fed into this sort of data, what we call our clinical data nexus. And through the combination of all of these different data inputs, um, some really powerful AI tools can be built that take into account multiple very high quality data sets and, and, and information foundations. And so that's really how we see um, what we're building at Tatawi is interacting in this environment. And again, that's really a center for where we can make sure that there is strong ethics, strong um, you know, risk aversion, mitigation of any potential biases at the point of the data. So um, just to give you also a little bit of a visualization, um, you know, when a, a patient goes in, into hospital, um, these days we are fortunate to have digitized health systems in most hospitals. So um, previously, maybe, you know, 20 years ago, you go to the hospital, get your blood pressure taken, it was written down on paper and then, you know, put in a file somewhere. That's quite difficult to do research on, although I'm sure people have. Um, now it's put into a computer system. And so that's creating a really big, rich data set of what we call real world data. So that's the RWE in Datawi. It's not data are we, but you can say that too. That's a nice, a nice idea. Um, but the real world evidence, again, is really key. Um, because when you're training a, an AI tool to be used in a real world setting, like in a hospital where things are messy, things aren't always like a clinical trial lined up and neat, you want to have trained it on real world situations and real world data. So all of this rich data that is collected when patients come in, they get blood tests, lab orders and that um, are actually really useful and valuable for training AI. Um, but 
in the hospital, because it's not the hospital's priority to focus on their data, it's not really necessarily stored in a way at the moment, which is ideal for building and training and translating AI tools. Um, it's very siloed. The demographics might go one place, the lab results might, might be stored elsewhere and so on, you can imagine. So again, that's something that Datawi really works on, um, you know, with our team of, of really experienced data scientists and engineers, um, actually putting all that data together, uh, which may sound simple, but it's quite difficult when you've got multi modes of data. So you've got image data, you've got structured data, you might even have doctor's notes. Um, that's a lot of what we do. So um, Really, you know, I guess in response to to sort of what um, Vaughan and Ash were um, were going over, you know, all the different challenges and all the different innovations that are available in this space, I think it's really key to think, you know, if we can get things right at the data point, then we can really innovate with trust and integrity and know that we're going to build really safe and secure tools um, and, and tools that will benefit everybody. Um, so, yeah, that's probably enough for me, um, but yeah, happy to answer any questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steph. And now we'll hand over to Roma for her reflections on what we've heard. Roma? Just enable technology. Thank you for the opportunity to present and it's good to see um, a few women in the AI space. It tends to be more of a, a male domain. Um, now, I did some research just around in my own communities about what does it all mean? What does AI mean? What automated decision-making um, means uh, to people? In my own domain, when I was working, we were, for example, working with uh, providers who are looking at atrial fibrillation screening to ensure that the patient didn't go into a stroke so that we could prevent stroke and therefore the hospitalization and the cost. So I think the whole concept of AI and automated decision making is extremely exciting. Um, pharmacogenomics is another one. After many years, a sudden I finally understood why coding is not a good product for me because actually my system doesn't like it, my body doesn't like it. So I think there is a lot more coming through in terms of personalized medication and also personalized services, uh, which is uh, exciting for people with uh, long-term conditions. Another research that I did on somebody very close to me with um, type one diabetes, this person was diagnosed over 33 years ago and some people would say to him that he looked like a junkie. Um, he had type one diabetes undiagnosed and once he was diagnosed, he said to me, it was like a roller coaster. It, the, the glucose would be up, would be down. There was so much that was happening that would impact his, his health. Today, he's using an app called Libralink um, and there is Libreview Libra and Libralink, uh, which has sensors, which actually measure um, his um, HbA1c and he's really excited if the next generation comes along and it will actually have insulin that can be adjusted into his body automatically. But he says that is like in the 33 years, it's the first game changer that he can really say that it's, it's really exciting for him. And then it goes to however. <laughs> so what does that mean for the consumer? So when I look at how some of the designs happens, so for example, looking at data we, um, you deal with hospital systems, which where the data can be sanitized because you must probably utilizing uh, one hospital vendor who link into the, the system that you're getting the data from. But if we look at across Australia, we've got um, in the GP area, we've got, I think, about six vendors. In the pharmacy sector, we've got about seven or eight vendors, and it keeps changing, going up or down. Um, then we've got hospital vendors with large systems. Again, there's about half a dozen. So all these systems need to talk to each other. They also need to accept data from um, various points. So this whole concept of, of having clean data and being able to perform all these things 
immediately is still quite nebulous because it still requires quite a lot of work, depending what it is that you work on. So that's my view based on, on what I know of, of the market. Um, today, I was also reading about Peter McCallum, a cancer research centre being involved in um, a project and they're developing an AI powered cloud platform to provide digital support for genetic disorders in with cancers and cardiac conditions. Incredibly exciting. How will this impact the consumers? What does it mean for us, the consumers? So looking at this, one of the things that um, was mentioned was data and data is really important. But to me as a consumer, the governance is really important because we are still lagging on some of the laws. We're implementing them because the technology is developing far faster than the, the laws. So I think we're adopting some of the things from OECD. Um, I know there is a lot of work to be uh, presented for comment latter part of this year, which I think is fantastic. So hopefully we consumers can get involved in those some of those submissions. Um, but to me, data governments is incredibly important. How is it accessed? Who's got access, who's, uh, what's done to it? Who's got access to it? And access to it today does not mean access to it tomorrow because organizations sign on third party providers and some of those providers um, reside internationally. So how are they made to comply with Australian regulations is one of my concerns as a consumer. Um, data protection and privacy pr protection, because these are two separate things. And what does it mean for, for us consumers in terms of data profiling? So there is the, the potential to include, exclude single or group. Um, and what does it mean for, for us? For example, if an insurer gets access to any of this data and decides to exclude people with high risk, um, is, is to me, that's an issue because we all should be treated equally. So what I'm hoping is that um, what is being currently designed it will protect the consumer in terms of the data profiling, in terms of inclusivity, um, and we need to look at people, you know, like there are children, there are disabled people, disabled in various ways. So it could be cognitive, it could be uh, mobility, um, elderly who do not comprehend um, all this new technologies coming through and they're frightened. When I asked, what do you understand of AI or automated decision-making? You have no idea how many blank faces I got just in my own network. So I think moving into the future, um, we need to look at things like education or raising awareness what AI is, what does it deliver. Um, I know Finland um, took upon themselves to develop an online course. Um, I think it's the Helsinki University. And you can actually do an artificial intelligence course um, which is free of charge. I looked at the course and I still think it's a little bit complicated for the average consumer, but we need to build awareness so that we're not frightened of this and we can have maybe some level of trust in um, some of these technologies that are coming through um, that I would be incredibly exciting to access, like, you know, nutrigenomics, pharmacogenomics, having medication specific to you as opposed to having an average type of medication which may suit your neighbor but not necessarily you. So I think there are a lot of exciting things but we still got a lot of work to be done. Um, also as consumers we would like to have access to the data that is being collected to about us. Um, we'd like to move the data and not be charged um, a lot of money for it would be wonderful. Um, be informed of the breaches and implications. And in certain circumstances, also remove the data because sometimes, you know, and again, this is, um, I was speaking to somebody whose wife um, had a severe neurological condition and she basically wanted to be removed from the system because she didn't want them, the treatment. It was the, the side effects were too harsh for her. And she said, I would rather 
live my life um, without the, the, all these other things that are people proposing to me because I know what's going to happen because it's happened to my mother, my sister and so on. So I think we need laws that permit us to do this safely and not have this information leaked to organisations that may use it against us. We also need to be able to raise complaints when we're adversely affected by I or ADM. Um, and I personally feel that each AI should be used as a decision support tool, not a decision tool, because then it goes to liability. So if the system says, Roma, you really should do this, but the doctor thinks, mm, based on what I know of Roma, I think this will be better. Who makes the decision? Who is liable? These are the questions that will need answered so that we've got some sort of clarity around what is being used um, and how it's impacting us. So I think I'm up to my five minutes um, <laughs> and to be able to answer questions. Um, I think that AI and decision-making systems should cause no harms to harm to us as consumers. Um, and it, we should not feel that the fact that we're ignorant of something because we don't understand it, that it's our fault because to understand AI takes many years of studies and it requires a particular brain to be able to code in it. And it, it's a complex area. And I don't think any consumer, average consumer can claim that they can comprehend all of that. So I think we need laws to protect us in those circumstances. Um, and we look towards governments to ensuring that um, our laws are there to protect us. Thank you. Well, that's a really good point, Roma. And a lot of the questions, which we're not gonna have time to answer all of them, so, so I apologize to people, but I think the key questions that have come up have mostly been around ethical considerations and privacy. And so maybe for Ash and Steph and Vaughan, if you want to, I mean, what do you see as the key, key ways that people's um, data is being protected and that the ethical questions are being addressed? Yeah, I'm happy to, oh, Ash can go ahead if you like. No, go ahead, Steph, you've got some really concrete examples, I know. So. Yeah, no, good. just, so yeah, just quickly, um, I think, um, First thing in terms of privacy, actually, let's start with ethics. Um, for example, at Datawi, um, if we interact with a researcher who wants to use our platform and access the data, every project still goes through HREC review. So it's a human research ethics committee. Um, we do not have custodianship or, um, you know, any decision making in who gets access to the, to the data that still sits with the custodians, which would be the consumers, clinicians, their hospitals. That's really key, I think, um, that that remains in place. Um, again, de-identification, it's, it's not as simple as it sounds. It's not about just removing a name. It's quite complex, but there is technology to address that now and truly, truly anonymised data. So it's the same as reading, you know, the COVID numbers. You're not reading anything about an individual, but that, that information has come from individual information, but it's really useful to be able to share that anonymous data. So if we start thinking about it like that, it's a lot of these technologies and research don't require names, you know, address, anything like that. A lot of that is unnecessary and will not be used in developing AI. And I think that's key. Um, and then in terms of, um, so yeah, I mean, I guess I think that covers a bit of both, a bit of ethics and privacy, but those are sort of two areas, I think. And also the, the technology, I think that, um, having more and more information sessions out there for people on what technology exists and how is it better than what's previously been done. Because previously, um, information um, for research has been shared on as a hard copy on a hard drive. And if you send that to a researcher, by all means, we trust the researcher. They sign that they will not share that, but you can't track that. Whereas if we use cloud environments, which is where you can see every single login to access that data, then you can cut it off immediately and you can know who is accessing that data. So there's a lot of new technology, which is might seem scary, but it also provides a lot of protection, increased protection from what we've previously used. Ash, did you want to add something to that? 
Yeah, I suppose I just wanted to say, which I think cuts across a lot of the um, fantastic questions that have come through in the Q&A and the chat. Um, a lot of these uh, protection structures do exist. So there are things like data protection uh, legislation, there are consumer protection and patient protection legislation and processes and guidelines in place. Um, of course, with these technological developments, we're seeing a lot of change, but it's not kind of, um, it's actually in most cases, not very dramatic revolutionary change that we're seeing. Kind of change in technology is very incremental. And so what exactly what centres like um, ours are funded to do is to try and make sure that uh, systems and legislation and ethical considerations and the inclusion of um, consumer expertise and experience is kept pace with development. So making sure that kind of what matters to people and people's experiences and issues like accessibility and inclusion and protection against data harm are built into the development. And that's why centres like ours are kind of um, set up in the ways that they are with industry partners like Consumers Health Forum, as well as partners like Google and Volvo and Red Cross. Um, we are the, we're kind of doing this work. We share a lot of the questions that you have. Um, we don't have answers for them today, but that's the work that we're trying to do over the next few years is answer some of the questions that people have raised. Um, so we're going to be doing research in this area um, over the next few years. We're funded for another, I think, five or six years in this space. Um, so if you have experience, we're very, very uh, keen to hear from you. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm sorry that we haven't got to all the questions. I'd just like to say that we see this as a conversation starter. So if there's anybody who's a participant who would like another session on anything particular that's been raised today, if you let us know at CHF we can always start, um, put together another webinar. And I know we'll come back to Ash and Vaughan when the research has gone a bit further down the track and get another update. And thank you so much to Steph, as you're doing some really interesting work and, uh, you know, and, and for Roma sharing a consumer perspective. So if you've got any ideas for what, what else you might like a webinar on or some work from CHF on in this field, please get in touch with us through info at chf.org.au. And I'd just like to thank the presenters and thank you all for participating and for the great questions. And have a good rest of the day. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.